You can do everything right, and it's still not enough. This tale is old as time. The one that you like, that you spend, spend, spend all your time thinking about, that you do literally everything for. I love the Smiths. Doesn't see you that way. I mean, what could be wrong with them? I, I, I said I love the Smiths. You bought them flowers, you showed up when they needed you. I don't know what to say. Like, I'm trying to do everything right to be a gentleman. I've done everything to be just the kind of guy that would value somebody's time. I'm, 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 I'm just looking for my person. You've given them your time, your thoughts, your attention. And for what? You just, you don't give up. Be, be, be. What do you get in return? You can do everything right, and it's still not enough. When you feel like you finally made a new friend, you send them texts all the time. Always ask them to hang out. Finally, someone you feel like you can connect to. Oh. And poof, you never hear from them again. They must have something wrong with them. How could someone do this to you? <laughs> bow, 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 bow. <laughs> Hi, you may not know me, but my name is Babilla, and welcome to Things I Thought Of, a show where I talk about things that I thought of. You know, I'm sure many of us have gone through the experience of being let on. Whether that be your high school crush who you really thought was into you, that friend that you thought was going to become your new bestie, that hookup that you thought was going to go somewhere, or by the leash by your mistress. <laughs> But I think most of us know how it feels. You're generally under the impression that this other individual feels the same way about you, but in reality, they could always just pull the rug out from under you. But let's try and get down to a good definition. According to Merriam-Webster, led on or leading on means to entice or induce to adopt or continue in a course of book. What the hell? I hate this definition. Fuck Merriam-Webster and whatever couch she's sitting on. I'm hitting the streets! Of the internet, I'm going to talk to some of my friends. Uh, what does it mean to lead someone on? I mean, I think... So to me... I mean, that should be simple, right? To lead someone on is to... Ooh. Yeah, I'm hoping the power comes on sometime in between this, but, like, I imagine it'll still record even if it, like, cuts out or whatever. If we're If we're in a situation where, like, you're, like, saying something and then, like, things end up freezing or things end up cutting off. Like, I have creative ways to, to deal with that. Uh, to basically behave in a way that suggests that you are interested in someone in ways that you're not. That's the most straightforward answer that I've ever given in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Our society would define leading someone on as like being flirtatious with someone or hinting at a romantic or sexual interest in them. And then when they try to make the interaction or the relationship romantic or sexual, you shut it down. And I think there's usually an end associated with that. So like, if you wanted that person to do you a favor or buy you something for you, um, persuading them to do that and then ceasing all of the affectionate or flirty behavior would be seen as leading them on. I would say it's an intentional attempt to point someone to a different direction than you're actually going. If you're presenting a different version of yourself with the intention of misdirection and to put them in a hole somewhere else, I think that's what leading someone on would be. I think, I think a lot of people tie it to like romantic attraction and dating and that kind of thing. To me, leading someone on, it's, it's an elongated maybe. I guess make promises that you not that you can't keep but that you did not intend to keep in the first place you're bringing someone to think one way about something that either isn't true or some bending of the truth is involved you're letting them know or letting them think things are going to end up one way and by the time they realize that it's not that way it's too late so essentially most people believe being led on to be someone being confusing or misleading with their intentions in a relationship, whether it be romantic or platonic. Knowing this, I think it's important to, th to, th to think about what it's like from two different perspectives. Hi, how are you? Are you enjoying the video? Cool. Then I have some really fun things to share with you. All the videos for the rest of the year are already planned out, so they should be really fun. But the one I'm looking forward to the most is a large, higher budget video that I'm codenaming the Holiday Special. 
for now. I'm collaborating with some friends at the channel like Zoe B. We started preliminary work two months ago, if that puts things into perspective. But for this to be the project I envision it to be, I'm going to need your help. From this point forward, all earnings from Patreon are going towards the budget of this holiday special. What are some of the perks of becoming a patron? Well, stinky. All $1 patrons get access to the Patreon after show, as well as access to my Discord server, The Yellow Zone trying to build up a community guys. All $5 patrons will have their name featured in every video. All $15 patrons will have a doodle featured in every video like these stinky people. And for anyone out there, anyone who is willing, there is a $25 tier available and you'll be featured in the video as a little animation. Will anyone choose this? I don't know, but it's there. I've also opened up a coffee account for one-time donations, and for convenience sake, I have also included my Venmo down below. I'm planning on having a cool way of tracking our monetary goal, but I spent two months working on this video, so uh, I'll worry about it later. Anyway, cool stuff ahead. If you have any faith in the content that I create, I would really appreciate the support. As you're watching the video, if you have anything to share slash add, please leave it down below. I love hearing what you guys have to say. It's literally my favorite part of all of this. But finally, I appreciate you for watching. Thanks. I've got no strings to hold me down. So we know what it is now, but what does it really look like and feel like to be led on? What are the emotions that you associate with it? A time that I was led on... Ooh. How, how, how do I want to share this? I was in a relationship, or I was in a, I was in a friendship, right? In which, like, we were just very close. But yeah. we all but we also were in college and very much like I enjoy physical touch. I enjoy showing my friends, you know, extra layers of intimacy that I wasn't allowed to show back in high school because of gender norms. College is also where you realize that actions do carry weight. Yeah. And like, yeah, so actions carry weight. And when you like play it all the way back, you realize, oh, when somebody does certain things, it does mean something to you. And mm -hmm. after a certain point, especially if you still uh, subscribe to like hegemonic, like gender norms, now you guys can't even talk about it because now we're playing cat and mouse and we're chasing. And that's mm -hmm. where a lot of miscommunications happen. And then once it all comes to a head, because it's kind of like, we need to address this now, that can leave you uh, feeling let on because you're like, oh, we've been like, we've been operating a certain way for years. People are like, it's obvious we're going two different ways. So there was this girl that I was talking to. She wasn't like necessarily conservative, but she was like very much a proponent of like certain criteria that you have to have before like you can commit to a relationship with somebody. I remember she was the first one to slide in my DMs and like I was the one that was like, oh, okay, like this is what type of time we got. We're dating not pretty much exclusively. I'm not really talking to any other girls. This is also a girl that would get upset if I was hanging out with other girls. Like I remember she got upset one time when I posted a Snapchat story of me eating lunch with my cousin and she didn't know it was my cousin. So she's like, who the fuck is this? And da 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 da. And I'm like, you know, three months goes by and I'm like, you know, what are we doing? Like, I'm an adult, you're an adult. Let's make this happen. I, I want to make this official. I want no confusion in regards to when people ask, what are we? I don't want to be like, man, I don't know. She hits me back and is like, she's basically talking about how much she can't trust me and how like Ooh. untrustworthy I am and how she's not really willing to commit to me because she has all these uh, issues about me personally. And, you know, these are not issues that have ever been brought up before. And if they have, she's like talking about stuff that like is like out of my control. Like, for example, she's like, you don't come over to see me. And I'm like, I don't have a car. It was a whole lot of like, what are you talking about? Or mm -hmm. you literally said that that was a non-issue two weeks ago. And it was a lot of back and forth with that. And with, it ended with me just being like, okay, well, we sh we don't need to be together then at all. If, if this is how you feel. I've definitely had someone who very purposefully was hitting on me. And i very autistic. So I, I have the social awareness of a snail when it comes to people being attracted to me, but you know, other people kept being like, oh, this person's interested in you very clearly. And it was very weird because they would kind of like almost pressure and then just like, be like, oh, okay, are you, so are you interested or not? Cause I'm just not someone that likes games, I guess. Um, I'm not sure if I am interested, but like, if you want to ask me on a date, just ask me because clearly you're the interested party here, I guess. Like, I, I guess it's kind of frustrating when people keep giving you like mixed signals and you're like, I don't know what to do with that like i'm i'm happy to be your friend but 
do you want more? Am I like not reciprocating the way that you want? Like, I'm like, what is, what are you doing? I just don't understand what you're doing <laughs> over there separately from me. The problem with being led on is that it feels like everything going on around you is confusing, especially if you're really deep into it. Every single action of this other individual could be interpreted in a certain way, especially if it's in a romantic context. You lack security that you may want in the relationship. I can think of times where it felt like I was being used, it really felt like another individual was enjoying having my affection and reassurance, but wasn't willing to commit to me or fully show it back. Those feelings were real. It feels like this person that's across from you has been dishonest with you. You feel like there's been so many signs showing that person feels the way that you think they do. That's the problem though. Like you do all these things for this person and what do you get in return? Nothing. You spend all this time thinking of this person, how you can make them happy, how they perceive you. And I find myself thinking, how could you do this to someone? And then I did it. <laughs> Something that I feel like I wish I understood when I was younger was the fact that a lot of times when people do things that cause harm, it's not because they're doing it with any ill intent. There's often a reason accompanying their actions. Does having an understanding of that weaken how bad it can make people feel? No. I would never forget when I read this tweet on Twitter that talked about intention versus impact. Basically, and I swear to God, God bless the person who wrote this. I don't remember their name. I don't remember if they were boy or girl, but I do remember the impact it had on me you don't have to mean harm to do harm and i had to apply this to myself and to other people because just because you say i didn't mean to that's not what i was trying to say that that person who you said it to may not register it like that but i know that a lot of times when you're holding the string it's not that you're intending on hurting this individual i have never intentionally led someone on I did not have sexual relations <laughs> with that woman. <laughs> I will say, it's not nice to intentionally and like maliciously try to make someone think something's gonna happen between you two, knowing that it won't, in an effort to extract something from them. But I don't, I feel like that's not what's happening most of the time when people say they've been let on. I've been told that I'm very flirtatious, even when, to me, that's not what I was doing. I have had that experience, but like, I know without a doubt. <laughs> <laughs> that I have never consciously tried to signal like sexual or romantic interest in a person in order to get something from them. So I've never let anyone on. But because flirtation is so subjective, because I joke around with my friends and sometimes I like to make jokes that are a little bit suggestive. And also because of the way that other people perceive my gender and my body, like I've been hypersexualized a lot in my life. There could be someone walking around on this earth who truly believes that I led them on. Most of my experience with this type of thing is mostly just people deciding that I was leading them on, which is funny. I think part of that was also just that when I was younger, I didn't realize like what ace was and so i think my romantic partners to some degree were maybe a little frustrated because i wasn't trying to have sex with them in the way that they ex expected expected from someone they viewed as a man i have some funny stories about being broken up with very specifically because my last girlfriend um i'm i'm dead serious about this basically breaks up with me over text after Boy. like five months of dating Basically, she's not comfortable dating a queer person. At the time, I was in the closet about transness. I was, I do think in that case, like, again, that, that's a case of someone just, if they had wanted that, they should have just maybe communicated that mm -hmm. they were interested in stuff. But I think before the breaking up stuff, I think there was just an aspect of like expecting me to be more um, maybe sexually aggressive and I'm not. I think there were there were a couple times in my life where I led someone on and I told myself it was because I didn't know how to let them down. Mm. That's what I told myself. I was like, it would hurt them. And I think that that's partially why I continue to engage in that behavior. But if I'm being perfectly honest with myself and like, you know, having, having a heart to heart with me for a moment, I think that part of it, a significant part, was that I was flattered by the attention. I was enjoying the interest. And I don't like admitting that. I don't like acknowledging that that was the case. But it was definitely that kind of situation where I had, you know, told the person in question. It was, it was a romantic interest. But then we continued to hang out. We continued to have really long, intimate phone conversations. We continued to sort of have this involvement as, in my mind, friends where it was clearly more intimate than that, they also had a certain level of responsibility in that, right? Like, I'm, I'm not responsible for other people's 
feelings to a certain extent. So they could have been like, you know what? I do have feelings here. This is not okay. I really need to step back from this. But I also could have been less of a let's hang out intimately as friends a whole lot, even though I know you have feelings for me. <laughs> this person made a statement uh, that having a friend like me was like having... 1995 in your bank account and i don't remember the specific wording but it was like you're not broke but you can't get it to do anything and i was like i i i i really don't like that language i'm not i'm not a resource that's a little bit weird i find that i more so like lead people on if anything uh because i don't like hurting people's feelings mm -hmm. so i find myself in predicaments of which i i didn't want to do something and now i'm doing it that could be romantically, that could be uh, professionally, like agreeing to things that I really just don't want to do. Saying no is, has been like an art that I've been trying to master. There was this one white girl. Every bad story I have probably starts with there's this one white girl. But there's this one white girl that uh, I knew in undergrad. She used to see me at the gym. She she was really smitten on your boy. I didn't I didn't have anything to offer this gal. But I didn't want to hurt her feelings. I also didn't want to put myself in a position where she develops some animosity towards me and that turns into some type of microaggression because like I said, she's at my gym. You, you gotta be careful with people that you see on a regular basis. Somehow I found myself on like a, not a date. I didn't even realize it was a date, but it was kind of, I think it was a date. At this point in hindsight, it was a date. And like, I was just like, how did we get here? And like, she was asking me about my future prospects. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. And she, was apoplectic she was just like well why would you agree to have um lunch with me i said i thought that you just wanted to have lunch with me but and i knew that i knew that she wanted more and i didn't want to hurt her feelings okay so i'm trying to think because i like to think that i'm ma very honest but i know that like when i was in my first relationship i was also in the term of figuring who i am out like what my sexuality is and so like now i'm very firmly landing on the fact that i am asexual and i think for a lot of the time in that relationship i was trying to pretend that i i didn't know yet and i was like oh maybe it's okay like maybe i don't know what i am and so i think something that i feel a lot of regret about is like not being honest with myself and with that other person be like no i'm firmly very much asexual and that's never something i'm going to be interested in it can be easy to mess around so much that you don't realize the reality of what you're doing until it's right in front of you. I once very openly flirted with someone, enticed them to go out with a group of my friends, then barely spoke to them the whole time. Which is an example of doing something shitty! I highly doubt she's watching now, but if she is, I'm sorry. <laughs> See, the big thing is being clear with your intentions. It's like, what do we want from each other? What do you want from me? What do you want from me? What do you want? Seems like we're lacking a little bit of clarity here. How about we think about it like this? I've never known someone like you. I think expectations are some of the best and worst things you can have or give. There's something beautiful about how expectations can be motivating, but simultaneously crushing. Truly a double-edged sword. It's kind of like how when you decide to pursue someone you're interested in, it's unfair to put expectations past a certain point on that person, for you to project what your ideal version of them is onto them. They have no duty to be who you want. You also shouldn't do that to yourself because you'll often end up disappointed. Living without expectations is scary. However, it's necessary, I think. Most happy moments exist without the influence of your expectations because in most situations your expectations don't have influence on what is truly going on. Babilla on a random Friday in December of 2020. Stringing people along is totally a real thing. It's possible to be misled by someone on what their true intentions are. And while there may be some semblance of responsibility on this other individual, the real culprit of your dismay is expectations. We live our lives with a certain expectation of how things are supposed to go. And when things don't go that way, it can be frustrating. We expect things to be the way that we've been told they'll be for our entire lives. If you go to college and get a degree, you'll get a good job. If you have a job in your 20s, you should be able to move out of your parents' house. When you finally achieve that goal you have, you'll reach lasting happiness. But just like a meme from the late 2010s, there's expectations, then there's reality. Happy birthday, Babilla. Thanks. Oh, it's a bomb. 
The way in which these expectations can affect us in a bad way can be seen through a movie that I'll talk about in just a second. But before we talk about it, I think we need to discuss why we have these expectations in the first place. In our relationships, what are we expecting? First, what we really need to talk about is... Tell me that you love me. What is love, baby, don't hurt me? But seriously, when you ask many people what they believe love to be, they'll also have a bunch of different definitions. We're shown a lot of examples of what love is. We read about it in books, we see it in movies, we listen to music, we supposedly live versions of it. Based on what we're shown, we build up expectations on what love is supposed to be. The problem with this is that many of these depictions are flawed, and for anyone living in real life, it's not hard to see why. In a movie like Beauty and the Beast, why other than Stockholm Syndrome would a woman kidnapped by a man fall in love with him? In a movie like Home Alone, what is loving about a family repeatedly abandoning their child? I know that's like kind of the whole point of the movie. And in Spongebob, what friend does any of these things? This is personal! I mean, look at the way he's dressed! Only somebody with holes drilled in their head would wear that stuff! It cost me one of my good noodle stars! Well, who cares about a stupid star? Gee, Patrick, it seems like you would care a lot about stupid stars, considering you are one. And that's just in movies and TV. There are many damning examples of things that people are willing to do in the name of love when their behavior is not loving at all. That's definitely not foreshadowing. But these are all grouped together because what qualifies as love is so wide. The depictions that we see can look wildly different. And when people attempt to define love, it's often met with either confusion or the notion that love is indefinable. Enter American academic theorist, author, and educator, Bell Hooks. Hooks sets out to provide a definition for love. And to start, she makes a specific distinction that love is not a feeling, but an action. This is based on a definition given by German social psychologist Erich Fromm. Love is the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. Love is as love does. Love is an act of will, namely both an intention and an action. Will also implies choice. We do not have to love. We choose to love. This first definition already butts heads with the common notion that a person falls in love because it implies that there's no agency in loving. One doesn't love by accident. So the idea of love at first sight or the sentiments shared by a lot of fairy tales are already being called into question. And in practice, I'm sure many of us can agree with that. This is why I bring up the concept of love, because this thing that Tom so desperately wants is not a thing to obtain. It's an action, and he's not doing it. And you're probably like, who's Tom? You should hold these. These, these are horses. They're yours. Continually, Hook shares that there are ingredients. Continually, Hook shares that there are certain ingredients that are important for love. To truly love, we must learn to mix various ingredients. Care, affection, recognition, respect, commitment, and trust, as well as honest and open communication. The value in us having a definition for love comes in the form of protection and fulfillment. When we know what love, when we, ah, when we know what it looks like to love and be loved, we can protect ourselves from those who claim to love us but continue to hurt us. When we understand love as a will to nurture our own, and another spiritual growth, it becomes clear that we cannot claim to love if we are hurtful and abusive. Love and abuse cannot coexist. Abuse and neglect are, by definition, the opposites of nurturance and care. Knowing these elements, it's hard to argue against the idea that this would be the makeup for a fulfilling relationship. It's a much more holistic definition of what things are supposed to look like. Phrasing it as leading, like someone led you on, kind of does a disservice to both of your emotions. Maybe it's not that you were like deliberately led on. Maybe it's just that you like misread something and there wasn't a clear enough communication there. I think what it comes down to is that a lot of people just, I think, struggle with direct communication, which is understandable. And I think holistics especially are very, they're very drawn to never saying what they actually me not to be mean but just and i think that can get them frustrated because it feels like they they want something like the other person isn't giving it because the other person's like i don't know what you're wanting from me like maybe there's a boundary that you need to set with others that say like hey when you touch my arm like this that makes me think that maybe you're interested in me so going forward if that's not the case maybe let's not like have that kind of contact like i think maybe the concept of leading people on opens the door for us to be able to communicate better about what we need but like the gals that did not want me made it very clear to me that they did not want me maybe it's a bahamian thing we're very forward about our feelings about like how we like if we want you especially um the women over here like 
If the women want you, they will let you know. But really, I'm the problem. Like, I am the problem in this in these instances. It would have been nicer and kinder to them to tell them straight up, like, hey, I do not have any plans for you. Faithful to you, even though we're not even technically together. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, I'm doing all the things that, like, a traditional uh, boyfriend is supposed to do. And she's complaining about how, like, not masculine I am. And I'm like... These were never issues when we were making out. You know what I'm saying? Like, you never had any issues like that at all. I feel like I, I really felt blindsided. I think that's kind of the right word for it. It was a lot of stuff that she never communicated to me that I'm now having to deal with, you know, as a result of, like, her not, in, not wanting to commit to me, but her turning it around for it to be my fault rather than her own reservations. It's different than just deeply caring for someone. That part is awesome, but it's also only one part of the idea of love. There are things that you need to be intentional about. And with this knowledge, of course, our expectations of love aren't being met. We expect things to be effortless. Everything should just click without a hitch. But knowing that love is a thing that you have to actively participate in changes things. When we feel like we're being led on, our behavior in response to things not going the way that we want can be an indication that we're not truly showing love to that under the what? be an indication that we're not truly showing love to the other individual but more on that later that's not the only thing I'm held together with a thin thread of green string. growing up i saw a lot of depictions of what i was supposed to be i remember my mom used to watch the bachelor and bachelorette on tv a lot and i'd see men with ripped abs chiseled features and assertiveness i'd watch shows like how i met your mother which was my favorite show for the longest time where the main character ted had been searching for love preaching the importance of persistence Lee, there is a word for that it's love i'm in love with her Okay? If you're looking for the word that means caring about someone beyond all rationality and wanting them to have everything they want, no matter how much it destroys you, it's love. And when you love someone, you just, you don't stop. Ever. Even when people roll their eyes or call you crazy, even then, especially then, you just, you don't give up. Because if I could give up, if I could just, you know, take the whole world's advice and, and move on and find someone else, that wouldn't be love. That would be, that would be some other disposable thing that is not worth fighting for. Which brings me to the second perpetrator. Entitlement. Let me explain it like this. Entitlement is basically an expectation of a certain outcome that's connected to an idea, identity, or experience. Entitlement is kind of a scary word for some people, so let's just think about it like that. The unique part is that with this expected outcome, whatever identity, idea, or experience that's connected to said expectation makes us think that we deserve that thing. Like those mesothelioma commercials. Attention. If you or a loved one was diagnosed with mesothelioma, you may be entitled to financial compensation. Mesothelioma is a rare cancer linked to asbestos exposure. That voice you saw always freaked me out. I literally get tears brought to my eyes every time I hear this voice because to this day, it still freaks me out. Because of our experience with asbestos and whatever our profession was, our expected outcome is to receive help for the cancer that we developed because we didn't ask for asbestos. The point is, we have an expected outcome based on identity, idea, or experience. Just like misconceptions about love can cause our experiences to not meet our expectations, misconceptions about entitlement can lead us to the same thing. In the case of relationships, entitlement can come from a few different places and cause a few different outcomes. According to psychiatrist Russell Lemley, there are four different ways that entitlement can be a fallback to get what you want from someone. One. You expect certain outcomes because of personal sacrifice or generosity. For example, I go along with what you want most of the time, so can you just go with what I want? It's the idea that because you don't ask for much, you've earned the right to drive the boat. I can make a whole video on this one alone. Two, you expect a certain outcome because you feel emotional or stressed. Because of how you're feeling, your partner doesn't really have a choice in what they do. What's going on? You gotta put it in there. I, I can't look at it unless it's toast. Experiences in the past can often make us feel this way. There are certain anxieties that we may have that have nothing to do with that other individual, but they still get affected by it. Three, you expect a certain outcome because you know more than another individual. This is often the rationality or efficiency argument because you see what you want as the best way to do it and you expect things to be done that way. And four, you expect a certain outcome because this is what people in relationships are supposed to do. This one has Tom written all over it. Who's Tom? Who's Tom? This is most obviously seen in contexts related to gender roles. 
In my personal experience, the ideas of masculinity and what a man is supposed to be paint the picture of an assertive, persistent, strong, stoic individual. Remember when I was talking about that like two minutes ago and I didn't talk about it until now? My script writing skills are impeccable. It's these ideas of entitlement that cause problems for so many people. Not only the people who are entitled, but the ones that they lay their expectations on. It's often done by people who feel that because someone was nice to them, because someone's become friends with them, because someone spends time with them, they are somehow entitled to that person's gratification. You know, <laughs> it's a it's a weird thing. And I think, you know, as someone who has experienced it while being perceived as a man and while being perceived as a woman, I kind of have a unique perspective on other people's response to these things. And, and, and every time it's always people that I'm like, there is no world in which I'm going to be interested in that. Like, especially men, especially since I came out. A lot of guys, because they've been raised in a patriarchal society, so I want to be clear, like, yes, obviously they have a personal responsibility to not be assholes, but also they're assholes for a reason and we should be able to talk about both things. You need to recognize that you've learned some shitty things from society and unpack it. The society stuff doesn't absolve you of your personal behaviors, but I do recognize that it is coming from a certain place, a certain place that I constantly had that messaging of you're supposed to be like this because you're supposed to be a man and I just didn't feel any connection to the type of sexuality that is expected of allo people in general, but especially for cishet men, which is as a closeted trans lesbian what I was interpreted as. But again, like every single one of my ex-girlfriends that I dated for any period of time were like, you're weirdly like a woman. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> language is a tool. It's always a tool. That's all it is. Um, how language gets used to perpetuate structures and methods of thinking. What I often see with leading someone on, not exclusively, but quite often, is mostly men, though not exclusively, again, but mostly cis men, mostly white, for being honest, talking about how women who have shown them, like, any positive attention are leading them on if they don't, you know, date them or have sex with them. It's, it's not really about the leading them on part, it's about the way that cis men are taught to feel entitled to sex. And anyone can do this type of mentality. We're just talking about like people with power are more likely to behave in that way because people in power are more likely to have the, the privilege required to feel that type of entitlement. It's not exclusive, but it's disproportionate. And so men who behave in this way, what they're really expressing is women who show me attention but don't give me the sex I feel I am entitled to because society told me that's what I'm entitled to. They must be leading me on. There is something bad about their behavior. They are rude. They are doing something shitty. Basically. It made me address the fact that I had done this work to acknowledge my sense of entitlement toward other people. And I was then creating a scenario where somebody else was sort of engaging in the same thing, you know? And that makes it so, that makes it sound really douchey. Like it was like, oh, it occurred to me that it was like the healthiest thing for this other person to get over this feeling toward me because they were acting with entitlement and blah, blah, blah. It's not necessarily like that. It was more that if I think that it's inappropriate to behave that way toward other people, who the hell am I to then encourage that behavior in someone else? I hope I don't like break your video and like go against, completely against whatever thesis you're forming because I, I I have a lot of thoughts. Honestly, I think it's kind of a barbaric concept. Like, <laughs> it's not unlike the concept of um, the friend zone. I think both hinge on entitlement. And I, my opinion is that a lot of the time when people say that they've been led on, they were attracted to someone and they read their interactions with that person as um, flirtatious and as a promise of a sexual or romantic relationship to come. And when that doesn't happen, when they don't get what they want, they say the other person led them on. I also think since what is being sexy and having a sparkling personality a crime? That's, <laughs> that's what I would like to know. And I think being accused of leading someone on is something that is disproportionately faced by women. That's the difficult thing about being led on, right? It's all, mm -hmm. I think being led on is a good big subjective because I do have a lot of stories of feeling like people had feelings for me and then realizing in retrospect, I was like, you know, maybe they were just being a nice person. There were plenty of times where people have caught feelings for me and I would be a little confused, but also not that confused because I'm a flirt and 
uh, a flirt in like the platonic sense. Like I, I, I enjoy being clever. I like to make a person feel good. If I, if I told this story about how I felt they led me on, I, I'm, a, I'm far enough away from it now to be like, well, you know, no one owes, no one owes you a relationship. No one owes you the answer that, that, that you want. And so I feel like there's no way I could tell really almost any story about being let on for me personally, in which I can't also say on the other side of it is like, but that's just my reading. That's just what I was expecting and hoping for. At its core, in interpersonal relationships, entitlement spits in the face of individual agency. The fact that you expect someone to act in the way that you expect them to, at least the idea that that person should be able to make choices freely. Many more rational people would likely say that everyone always has the right to say no to whatever they don't want to do, which they do, um, but quotations because I don't really agree with them being rational. This idea leaves out the fact that not everyone is great at speaking up for themselves, especially when they're feeling the added pressure from someone they really care about. Less rational people uh, don't care at all, which is bad. <laughs> this is why in romantic relationships, women, femmes, and envies often fear the idea of telling a man no because they don't know what kind of reaction they're going to have. In the most PG example possible, I'm sure most men in masks can remember a time where you or someone you know had a crush on someone, and that person eventually got turned down, immediately the changeup was wild. Like on some Nash, I hate you, I love you, featuring Olivia O'Brien parentheses music video parentheses type shit or whatever. You hear them constantly talk shit about this person, criticizing everything they do, what they wear, how they talk, etc. just because they don't really like them like that. It can be much more severe than that. Um, the big boy version is ask for consent regularly, wait for eager consent, and if they say no, respect it. That's the problem with persistence. If you're really respecting someone's decision, you won't keep on pushing them. As an ace lesbian, like, I am interested in romance and things. That's, that's part of the joke of the, the makeup that I did. It's actually an old ace symbol set. Ace of hearts meaning someone who still experiences romantic attraction but is asexual. Like, it's a funny pun, but it also, I thought it would be a fun visual. I'm not really interested in sex. Separate from my lack of sexual attraction, just a lot of trauma around things. And part of that trauma comes from people who very much felt that because I was kind to them or whatever, I was leading them on. For me, fundamentally, that phrase is just interconnected with sexual violence, and that's what I think of when I see it. The point is, fearing retribution is pretty common for non-binary people, women, and femmes in the face of giving honest responses to men. Another problem that we run into is the idea that there's a specific way that things are supposed to go down in our relationships, like what it looks like for a relationship to begin or what it looks like to love someone, what you're supposed to do, etc., etc. And again, this is just in the general sense in both romantic and platonic relationships. That's where the concept of leading people on truly comes into play. Everyone is different and everyone moves at their own pace, and sometimes it takes time for people to settle into how they really feel feel. And the way the different media have portrayed relationships has led us to have an unreasonable expectation for how things are meant to happen. There is no meant to happen! Because the way that we as individuals handle our relationships are different. Everyone moves at their own pace, and to make the assumption that X always means Y, I don't think is entirely fair. Just because someone says that they enjoy spending time with you doesn't mean that you're meant to be together. Just because someone has expressed interest in you at some point doesn't mean that they're interested in you now or that you're best friends. This transactional mindset causes us to constantly be disappointed because our expectations are not being met. Even though media like movies and TV have led me to believe a lot of the things that I believe about the dynamics of relationships, I can't think of a better way to break down these beliefs than with a movie. <laughs> Hey, this this is Tom. We meet Tom. Tom is the main character of the movie, played by Joseph Gordon Levitt. Throughout the film, Tom is infatuated with Summer, played by Zoe De Chanel. As we follow the nonlinear narrative of the film, we get to see the highs and lows of their relationship across 500 days, exclusively from Tom's perspective. Tom believes that he's found the one. The problem with this is that, instead of taking in the sights and signs of what Summer really wanted, Tom is focused on the narrative that he has already crafted in his brain. Throughout the movie, Summer repeatedly indicates that she doesn't want to be in a relationship. It's said multiple times, and instead of listening to what Summer has to say, Tom continues to project his feelings onto her. They were good as married in his mind, but married in his mind is no good. Um, do you have a boyfriend? No. Why not? Because I don't want one, and I just don't want to be anyone's girlfriend, and I'm not actually comfortable being anyone's anything, you know? I like being on my own. Relationships are messy, and people's feelings get hurt. Who needs it? What happens if you fall in love? You don't actually believe in that, do you? 
What does that word even mean? I've been in relationships and I can honestly say that I've never seen it. There's no such thing as love, it's fantasy. I think you're wrong. Tom shares our problem of having specific expectations of his relationship. And just like most people, those expectations are not reality with Summer. Despite that, the two of them continue their relationship with each other, not putting any labels on it. Good example of what happens when two people have differing expectations of how a relationship is supposed to go. What a bot, bro. You're trying to tell me that Tom isn't allowed to have expectations for his relationship? I just got called a bot by a sock puppet of my own creation, but I'm making a point here. Tom is insistent on things being the way that he envisions romantic relationships to be, not listening to Summer. You can really clearly see this in the scene where she shares some personal stuff that she'd never told anyone before. The movie doesn't even tell us what it is because Tom is so focused on the fact that it's happening that it's narratively unimportant what it was. Tom began to realize that these weren't stories routinely told. These were stories one had to earn. He could feel the wall coming down. He wondered if anyone else had made it this far. Which is why the next six words changed everything. I've never told anybody that before. We can key in on behaviors that Tom is exhibiting here and throughout the film as examples of the two factors I discussed before that affect our expectations, love and entitlement. Tom really believes that he was in love with Summer, but was he practicing love according to Hooks? As previously stated, according to Hooks, love requires care, affection, recognition, respect, commitment, and trust, as well as open and honest communication. It's clear that Tom really cares about Summer, or at least the idea of her. He shows her affection, and he's committed to her. However, if Tom was really engaging in the action of love, he'd respect Summer's wishes and her opinions, and recognize her for who she really is. He wouldn't shit on her music opinions. He wouldn't forcefully tell Summer what their relationship was. I like you, Tom. I just don't want to relate. Well, you're not the only one that gets to say in this. I do too. And I say we're a couple. God damn it. Because respect for her and her agency wouldn't allow him to just state what their two-person relationship was. Recognizing her for who she really is would mean to look past the idea of her that he'd formed in his head. Which brings us to entitlement. Tom is so tied to the idea of what a relationship is supposed to be that he pigeonholes Summer into that role rather than just taking her as she is. This idea of how relationships are supposed to be causes harm to himself too, as it causes him to do reckless things like engaging in a bar fight that no one asked him to engage in. So let me buy you a drink. No, thank you. You with this guy? Hey, I'm Tom. Whatever. I'm flattered, but I'm not interested. So why don't you go over there and leave us alone? Thanks. It's a free country. Can't believe this is your boyfriend. <laughs> what are you doing? That lack of respect before, during, and after the relationship that's not love. The lack of recognition of who she really was is not love. He's not taking her agency into account, and it doesn't even really seem like he accepts this at the end of the movie. He just moves on to someone named Autumn. My name's Tom. Nice to meet you. I'm Autumn. Please. Also, the fact that Summer doesn't really like him that much is not a crime. That's just reality. A reality that a lot of people don't seem to understand. Just because someone decides that they don't like you anymore doesn't make them a bad person. It just makes them a person. There isn't anything that we are truly entitled to in life. I believe that there are things that we should be entitled to, like food and a place to stay. It's pretty wild if you think otherwise, if you ask me. However, there are things that we really aren't entitled to. It also gets used to directly manipulate people. Because if you're a woman, you've probably experienced men being like you're leading me on and whatever like, like trying to pressure you into feeling that you somehow owe them that they are entitled to your body and it's really frustrating it's really difficult to deal with and again i want to be very clear this can get used by anybody towards anybody i, I personally have experienced it from women who perceived me as being a guy when i was much younger and i was in the closet but i will tell you the aggressiveness the display of this it's a lot worse for men. <laughs> I'm being careful wording this because I know when we try to talk about the behaviors of the dominant privileged group, people who have had these negative experiences done to them, what they hear is, is a denial of their trauma or pain or things they've experienced. And I'm not denying your experiences, but I am talking about how social structures build up these entitlements. Whether you've been friends for five years, dating for 10, or married for 50, you're not entitled to control over someone's body, what they wear, what they do, and how they spend their time. 
That's also why the idea of saying someone else's actions are crossing a boundary when it actually has nothing to do with you is pretty wild. Because that's not respecting that person's agency. Your boundaries are around you, not them. <laughs> a person in a romantic or non-romantic relationship reserves the right to leave whenever they want. If you're not vibing with someone anymore, you shouldn't feel trapped where you are. And we should never be the trappers. I speak specifically from the perspective of a man who is under the pressures of hegemonic masculinity. I feel the pressure to be assertive, to be persistent. Even though there are pieces of my nature that are understanding, pieces of me that can see other people's perspectives, it's this hegemony that has created blind spots for me in the past. Like a level of pressure or a, a level of internal belief that certain behaviors are okay when they're really not. Especially when putting myself in the shoes of a woman. A lot of times, it's not because you're intentionally trying to be oppressive. If you are, that's an example of doing something shitty. But regardless of intention, it's still an example of doing something shitty. A lot of times, it's just that you're not really thinking about it. You're not really considering what this other person's thoughts and feelings are. It's ignorance and not really listening. Summer never led Tom on, he just never listened to her. This is your invitation to start thinking about it more. You should really start thinking about it more. Please, start thinking about it more. Come on guys, real trailblazers are free thinkers. The real red pill is caring about- <laughs> You're not entitled to anything from anyone. But just like the point that I made earlier, there are things that you should do. Now, as I make this point, I'm in no way trying to blame slash put responsibility on anyone. Special shout out to women, femmes, and MBs. Because first of all, all of this can be applicable to anyone. And two, I don't think people experiencing harm should be blamed for what happens to them, especially in this kind of context. What I am trying to say, this came out in very convoluted fashion. Disclaimer aside, there are some things that you should do for the benefit of yourself and others just because it's good really believe that practicing love is one of those things. Communicate honestly and openly with the people around you. Show them genuine care. Accept them for who they really are. Show them respect and acknowledge their individual agency. Show affection to them and be committed to it. But it looks like to show love to the people around us can be really confusing. When we grow up, the things that we're fed about what love means are often not the whole truth, a deluded truth or a false truth. False truth is just being false. I don't know why I said that. Our heads are filled with the idea that we fall in love with people. A falsehood that makes love out to be something that we don't have agency in. We're told that people who have hurt us growing up do it because they love us. We're told that love should be easy, but it's not the truth. In all relationships, platonic or romantic, true, deep love takes work. It takes time. It's an action that we take part in. It's more than just caring about someone. It's trusting them, committing to them. It's communicating and respecting each other. A lot of times we don't have the courage to say how we really feel about each other. At this point, I've realized the value of making sure that everyone is clear about their feelings and communicating in a kind and caring way. It really helps to make sure that nobody gets hurt. Now, sometimes people get hurt anyway, but at least it's not because they're confused about what's going on. Once both people know what their intentions are and they've communicated that, if someone doesn't respect that, that's really more on them. I can be really, really bad at this. I don't want to act like I'm some expert at any of this stuff. I just know it now. We're not entitled to anyone's intention or feeling. So if someone isn't rocking with us in the way that we're rocking with them, we can't force them to feel any kind of way. Always give people the avenue to be able to make their own decisions. Making sure we understand, listen to, and communicate with each other can keep things from getting tangled. Even though my feelings about being let on have been real, my ideas on the concept have changed a lot. But hey, that's just the thing I thought of.